Welcome to the Sanctuary of Liberty Baptist Church of Chicago. We are so excited that you tuned in for Friday Night Word. Over the past several years, we've been blessed by you, your comments, your encouragement for our media ministry. You may feel that we have helped you, but we want you to know you've been a blessing to us. And because of that, the Lord put in our spirit to do Friday night word. This is an opportunity as you come to the close of your week to hear a word from God that carries you through the weekend and into the next week. We know that weekends can be hectic and sometimes we may forget to tune in on Sunday. And so this is yet another opportunity for God to speak to you on what he has specifically for you. We pray that Friday night word is a blessing to you. I have been praying for you. I may not know some of you all's names. I may never see your face. But I want you to know I have been praying that this moment bless you, liberate, and transform your life. We are excited to have you as part of the family of Liberty Baptist Church of Chicago. And for those of you that often hear it, and those of you that may be hearing this for the first time, we never start a worship service here at Liberty Baptist Church without this affirmation. Something that is great for Sunday and only for Sunday. But we declare today that this word is good for Friday. And so without any further ado, I declare friends and family, it's church time. It's church time. Oh, yes, it's church time. Welcome to Friday Night Word. Church of Chicago. Come on, if you're happy to be here, somebody shout hallelujah, hallelujah. for it is the highest praise. Yes. If you're at home, you can shout hallelujah. If you're at home, you can clap your hands. Am I talking to anybody on the internet or in here today that is just glad to be here? If you're just glad to be here, that's worthy of your hallelujah. hallelujah. We are in April and we are looking forward to remembering what our Lord and Savior has done for us. This is a special time of year as we prepare for spring, for the harvest to come. And so I am so delighted to see some of you all for the very first time here in this sanctuary. We are always delighted to see you on Facebook and YouTube. You encourage us to keep on keeping on. Thank you for your likes, thank you for your hearts, and thank you for your comments. We thank you for your giving, whether it be by Givelify, sending mail to the church. And we thank all of you in here for every Sunday taking time before you leave this place to give your gifts accordingly. But the greatest gift that we can give one another is a smile. The greatest gift we can give one another is a hello. And the greatest gift we can give the Lord is our highest praise. Am I right about it? You don't have enough to give him, but you can praise him. You don't have enough strength to hold him up, but you can clap your hands because he is good. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. 
We have some special observations today. The first observation is Holy Week is coming. And when Holy Week comes on Tuesday, we're having a breakfast. We're having a breakfast on Tuesday. You are welcome to come to the breakfast. And the breakfast is free of charge. Free of charge. We're giving to-go containers for you to leave and take your food with you. If you're not comfortable sitting within the group, we'll social distance accordingly. But in order to give breakfast free of charge, we need to know who's coming. Amen. Because I have not yet perfected waving my hands over some fish and some bread and multiplying. <laughs> and since I have not done that yet, we're going to ask you after service to register at the front desk. Register at the front desk to say that you're coming Tuesday before Easter at 9 o'clock for breakfast. If you're going out the side, register. Don't assume we see you here all the time. Facebook and YouTube, if you want some breakfast, I don't care if that's your first time coming back to church for some free breakfast. Only thing you got to do is call the church and register. And we look forward to kicking off Holy Week with a breakfast. We have some more pertinent information to share today. You know, we always have cyber members. And we've had cyber members join our church that had not been here in years for various reasons. Well, you all know William Conley was a son of this church. Right. And his wife, Doris Conley, is a daughter of this church. Yes. My great mentor, William Conley, went to be on with the Lord. But one Sunday, when we were having service, Doris Conley said, I am ready. And Doris Conley joined the church. But that's not the biggest thing. The biggest thing is Doris Conley is here today for the first time. Raise your hand, Sister Conley. Welcome home. Welcome home to Liberty Baptist Church of Chicago. We got one more thing. I don't announce dates that much. I don't announce dates that much because I know if I miss one, oh my goodness, I'm gonna be in trouble. But I do mention dates sometime when it happens on the day we are in the house. And we have somebody special here today. This is her first time in the house since the pandemic. And Muriel Tate, over to my right, is celebrating 41 years of membership at Liberty Baptist Church of Chicago on today. Oh, and with that shout, and with that clap, we say, Sister Conley, it's church time. We say, Muriel Tate, it's church time. We say to everybody, it's church time. you to walk with me to the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we come before you, humble as we know how, Heavenly Father, thanking you for each and every day, Heavenly Father, that you have given us. 
Heavenly Father, we know that there are those who are going through some trials and tribulations right now at this time, Heavenly Father. Whether it's sickness, whether it's loss, whether it's unemployment, we can go on and on, Heavenly Father. But we know that you are a true God, Heavenly Father, and through those obstacles, Heavenly Father, we find joy because we find loved ones that stand by our sides no matter what when we're going through the rough storms. We always have a church home, Heavenly Father, where we have a shepherd of this house who's always on his knees in prayer for us, Heavenly Father. And we know that your blessings is not just because we've been so good to you, Heavenly Father, but it's for those who have been praying for us. Somebody's always praying for us, Heavenly Father. We just ask that you teach us, Heavenly Father, how to pass it on and do the same. Heavenly Father, bless our hearts. Make them soft. Make them loving. Make them kind. For that is what you are, Heavenly Father. You are love. You sent your only begotten Son, Heavenly Father, to die on the cross for us. That was a sacrifice. And we know it. And we're all making sacrifices each and every day, Heavenly Father, as we walk out of our homes trying to be safe, to make it to our destinations. But you're so good to us, Heavenly Father. You're so good and so kind. We just can't praise you enough. And at this time, Heavenly Father, we open up our hearts to you, Heavenly Father. Come into these vessels, Heavenly Father, and anoint them. Bless them, strengthen them, Heavenly Father. Teach them your ways. Allow us to see when the devil is busy, Heavenly Father, and allow us not to fall into his traps. Show us the right way to go, Heavenly Father, for we know that you know the right way. It might not be our way, Heavenly Father. It might be a long way, but you said it in the courts. You brought each and every one of us into this world, Heavenly Father, for a purpose. Allow us to listen, Heavenly Father, to our pastor. Allow us to listen to our church members, Heavenly Father. Allow us to recognize our sisters and brothers that are out on the street struggling, Heavenly Father. Those that don't have food to eat, Heavenly Father. Sometimes we sit up and we wrestle with it. Should I give them a dollar? Should I give them 50 cents? But Heavenly Father, we ask that you allow us to listen to our hearts because our hearts will never lead us astray. You know who we're to bless and not to bless, Heavenly Father. So we just ask that you always stay with us. We know that that mind is a, is a strange thing, Heavenly Father. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it remembers and sometimes it forgets. But Heavenly Father, even when it forgets, I've seen individuals that can't remember what they did yesterday but they sure know how to stand in the need of prayer. That's when they really call on you, Heavenly Father, when they don't have strength of their own, Heavenly Father, to put their shoes on or do things in their right minds. They, they call on you. But at this time, Heavenly Father, we come to you with our right minds, Heavenly Father, giving you all the praise and all the glory, Heavenly Father. We can't say thank you enough, and we know it. But we just ask that you bless this house and even outside of this house, Heavenly Father. This church goes further than just these four walls. It goes from the heaven to the earth. And you made it, Heavenly Father. You made everything perfect in your way. You made us. So if we continue to look to the hills from which cometh our help, Heavenly Father, we can do no wrong. Just allow us to love one another, Heavenly Father. And as we come to a close, we just thank you, we thank you, we thank you. It is us, it is us standing in the need of prayer. Amen.
sing with us now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a wonder. What a wonder you are. Think of his goodness to you. What a wonder you are. Everybody just close your eyes in here. Lift up your hands and think about that. What a wonder you are. For all that you've been through. Oh. You could have lost your mind, but what? What a wonder you are. I'm talking to some folks in here that had cancer. And your head went bald, but now you can say. What a wonder you are. Anybody here ever been in a car accident? Your car was wrecked. People said, how did somebody get out what of that? What a wonder you are. Anybody here been broken heart? Uh -huh. Thought they were going to lose <laughs> their mind. But you can say today. What a wonder you are. Anybody thought they didn't want to come this morning? Because they might have been scared of cold. Or they might have been mad. But now you say. What a wonder you are. from the Lord today. In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, verses 14 through 21. Isaiah 43, 14 through 21. When you found it, won't you stand for the reading of God's holy word. Isaiah 43, 14 through 21. Would all who are able stand now in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. Hold your Bibles high and repeat after me. This is, this is the word of God. The word of God. It has liberated. It has liberated. And transforming power. And transforming power. I will praise God. I will praise God. For this preaching moment. For this preaching moment. And I declare. And I declare. That after this moment. That after this moment. That I shall never. I shall never. Ever. Ever. Be the same. Be the same. God be praised. In Isaiah 43. Verses 14 through 21 in the New Revised Standard Version. These words are faithfully recorded. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and break down all the bars and the shouting of the Chaldeans which be returned to lamentation. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior, 
They lay down. They cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Yeah. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and the rivers in the desert. Huh. Wild animals will honor me and the jackals and ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. To give drink to my chosen people. For the people whom I formed for myself. Yes. So they, they might declare my praise. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Edification of our hearts and our souls. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Verse 19. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I want to look you to look at your neighbor right now and recite this morning's topic. Look at him. Let me see you look at him. Most of y'all still got your mask on. With conviction, look at your neighbor and tell this. Tell them this, don't miss, don't miss. Your, new thing. your new thing. I'm about to do a new thing that springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Don't miss your new thing. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this moment. We thank you, God, for being wonderful. We thank you, God, for your wonderful nature has brought us here one more time. Now, Lord, touch the words of my mouth. Let them not be in my own understanding nor my opinion. But Lord, let them fall fresh from you. Someone may be liberated and transformed by the renewing of their mind. This indeed is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't miss your new thing. Yes, sir. The book of Isaiah covers approximately 200 years in the life of Israel. It begins with three Babylonian exiles, beginning with the infamous year that King Uzziah died. Well, Isaiah saw the Lord sitting high on the throne. When asked, who can I send and who will go for us, it was Isaiah that said, here am I, send me. And that began to spark the record of the pre-Babylonian captivity story of Israel. Isaiah then transitions into life of Israel in exile, the exilic period. When they did not heed to God's word, they found themselves in exile. And as we hear this to read this 200-year historical account, we finally see in the latter part of Isaiah, we find Israel in what's called the post-exilic phase, attempting to find this way now that they are free, they are free, but they are yet have to reconcile themselves to God. That's another sermon for another day. <laughs> um, because of the passage of time in the book of Isaiah, these three different periods of Israelite history, and the noticeable shift in tone of the prophet's voice throughout the text, it is widely accepted that the book of Isaiah is a compilation of three prophetic voices. One is Isaiah himself, 
writing in the pre-exilic period. The second, known as second Isaiah or Deutero Isaiah, is writing during the exilic period. And third Isaiah or Trico Isaiah now writes in the post-exilic period now that Israel is free from Babylonian captivity. Today we engage in the writing of second Isaiah. Second Isaiah is now writing to Israel in exile. He's writing to them in captivity. The Babylonian Empire was one of the greatest empires of historical and ancient record. Uh, Babylon, Babylon began to extend beyond walls that were unimaginable. And here, the children of Israel, the one of the God of their weary years, the God of the silent tears, find themselves enslaved in exile in Babylon. Uh, people who had, through a God that had the whole world in his hand, yet find themselves in exile. So Isaiah is writing them to know, but not to remind them that they are in exile. What he's writing them to let them know is that they can be delivered. And I stop by here today, every Sunday, much like second Isaiah. My plight is not to tell you in, that you're in exile, but my joy comes from letting you know you can be delivered. Um, there is no sermon tone that is adequate enough if we don't explain exile, but yet the, the process of being delivered. Look at your neighbor and say, I can be delivered. I can be delivered. His point is to let them know that no matter how hard times may be, is that the Lord wants to make a way somehow. He tells them in verse 19, boldly and matter of fact, that I'm about to do a new thing. God is speaking through Deutero Isaiah. He's speaking through him and he's letting the people know, I'm about to do a new thing that's going to spring forth. He didn't say I might do a new thing. He didn't say, if you do this or do that, I'll do a new thing. He says, I'm about to do a new thing. And he doesn't say that the new thing is just going to slowly, gradually come in. He says, no, the new thing is going to spring forth. And when a new thing springs forth, it doesn't have time to wait on us. A new thing that God puts, it springs forth and it is radioactive joy when a new thing springs forth. But despite Isaiah, second Isaiah's matter of fact indication about a new thing, what caught my attention is the latter part of verse 19. He asked them, do you believe it? He's saying, matter of fact, God is saying, I'm going to do a new thing. It's going to spring forth. It's going to be unimaginable, but my problem is you. My problem is, do you believe that I'll do what I said I would do? So second Isaiah brings us into the truth of life, that we can yet experience a new thing, new time, but miss it. And the missing is not on the part of God. The missing is on the part of us. God wants to do for all of us a new thing. But we are in captivity. We are not in captivity by shackles on our arms and shackles on our feet. We are not in captivity because we have been muted with tape over our mouths. We are in captivity by our minds. And if you keep on living, life will take you through some stuff that will lock up 
your mind. I, maybe y'all haven't been through it, but I've been through some stuff and that I have allowed to lock up my mind, allowed to steal my joy. And see, when God gets ready to do a new thing, if you are in captivity, you can't see the new thing. Because what captivity does is it kills your spiritual self-esteem. Captivity makes you think you're not worthy of God's blessing. Captivity thinks that God is not capable of springing a new thing up in your life. Captivity thinks that because you were born on the other side of the tracks, that there's no good thing that can come out of you. Captivity makes you think that due to your age, you're not mature enough to stand on the promises of God. Captivity makes you think that because you're in your senior years that you've seen the best thing that God could have ever done for you. But I want you to know no matter how old you are, God is not through with you yet. You just got to perceive a new thing. But when you're in captivity, you run the risk of missing a new thing. See, I don't know everybody's story in here. I don't know. But I venture that there's one or two, three people in here. You've been going through the same thing your whole life. That's not because of the Lord. You missed the opportunity for your new thing. And it becomes more convenient to stay in captivity. Because you ain't got to do nothing when you're in captivity. You just sit there chained up. Just sit there complaining all night long. Ain't nothing ever been good. Ain't nothing going to ever be right. That's because you are in captivity. But when the new thing comes, you say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Everything is going to be all right. We are celebrating a season right now in this text. It's from the lectionary for the Sunday before Palm Sunday. We are entering a season where we can see how God's people missed a new thing. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. There were all of the signs of his dignity and his deity. He performed miracles that no man could have performed. He cast out demons. Israel, after all the years of struggle, received a new thing, but they didn't want to receive it because their mind was in captivity. Here the blessing of God came down, but they could not see it because they were used to doing things in their lives the way they used to. And because they were in captivity, the very Son of God came down. God dropped onto humanity a new thing. But they nailed him to the cross. Yeah. So anybody here that's struggling in life today, you saying they don't understand me, and you saying as much as I do, they can't make it. Don't worry. Human beings always have problems recognizing a new and good thing. It's in the book, y'all. It's in the book. We got the advantage of 2,000 years later, but here, everything they had prayed for, everything they had hoped for, was standing in the midst of him, but before it was over, because their minds were in captivity, all they could say was crucify him. They missed their new thing. As we reflect on the text, Isaiah inspires us this morning to not allow spiritual blindness to result in our missing of a new thing. We want God to put visine on our spiritual eyes. <laughs> we want God to begin to put some bifocals. I got them, y'all. On the glasses of your spirit. And Isaiah gives us what we need 
to see our new face. First thing, you can experience new things. Because Isaiah, in several points of the text, defines who the Lord is. Isaiah says you're going to experience a new thing because the Lord says, I'm the Lord, the Redeemer. I am the Creator. I am the Holy One. I am the King. And if you, when you want to believe, worry about if God's going to do a new thing, believe who the Lord is. Believe that the earth is the Lord's and they that dwell therein. Believe that this ain't about you. It's about the Lord. Believe that he is the Lord. That means he's got everything at the same time. Believe he's a redeemer. That means he can deliver your soul and deliver you out of your mess. And believe that he is the Holy One. For there is no other than him. Believe he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. And if God is who he said he would be, he can bring forth not only a new thing, but a better thing. But when you forget, when you're in captivity, and you forget who the Lord is. When you're in captivity, and it's more about who you are and not who the Lord is, it becomes more convenient to stay locked up. But the Lord can break every chain. See, he can do a new thing because he's the Lord. He can change his mind because he's the Lord. He can say walk a new way because he is the Lord. So when you're faced with a new thing, don't think about you. Think about the Lord. Don't miss your new thing. We miss, second thing to be careful of, in our life's journey. Just like Israel then and Israel in the New Testament. The past will make you miss your new thing. Didn't nobody ask you if you was a dope head? There's a new thing. <laughs> Didn't nobody ask you if you were a drunk? It's a new thing. <laughs> Didn't nobody ask you if you were a pimp or a prostitute? It is a new thing. Didn't nobody ask you if you were in poverty or not? This is a new thing. And if you hold on to the past, it will keep you from embracing your new thing. And if you ain't shouting right now, that's because the past got you locked up. But I'm about to break it down. Break it down. Break it down. Verse 17. God says, remember the Red Sea. Remember when you cross. I'm paraphrasing what God said now. Remember when you cross. And, and remember the wicked. I, I quenched them. I burned them up like a wick. I burned the chariots and the horses up the army and the warriors up, you crossed over the Red Sea. Yeah. He reminds them. Well, I'm going somewhere. Go ahead, go ahead. He reminds them. But is it not interesting that after he reminds them, he says this. I know you brought you through the Red Sea. Verse 18. <laughs> I knew about the good old days. I know what Moses did. I know about the burning verse, verse 17. <laughs> but verse 18, he says, and do not remember the former things. Come on, come on. I know I did it, but don't remember that. Or consider the things of old. He says that. And then right after he says that, he says, and I'm about to do a new thing, but do you perceive it? See, you can't, you can't perceive it because you're too busy talking about the Red Sea. 
You too busy talking about Moses. You too busy talking about I can't get nowhere because of who I am. If I had advantages of everybody else, I'd be way up here, down here. I wish my mama was better. I wish my daddy was better. I just hate that I was a dope head. I just hate that I was not the best person. But God is saying, don't worry about what you used to be. Don't worry about the old things. If you let me, I'll do a new thing. That's all he's saying. Woo, but I know I got some smart Alex in here. I know I got some smart Come on, Alex. come on. So the Lord gave me a word for the smart Alex. <laughs> Driving my car just a few weeks ago, and I was challenged with this concept of how do we manage the old? How do we manage the past? Watch this thing, y'all. Watch what God gave me. Driving my car, making the right turn. See, God talks to me sometimes when I'm just riding in my car. How do we handle this deceit? We understand our past is our inspiration and not our obligation. Our past is our inspiration, but not our obligation. Can I add a little something on when I made the left turn down Stony Island? Our past is not our inspiration. Our future is our obligation. That's how you handle that. No, you don't throw the Red Sea away. That's why God mentioned it. But he mentioned it. He mentions it because our past reminds us what God did. See, it doesn't matter how we did it. It matters who did it. And so we, we reflect on our past because our past is our inspiration. Our past says if he did it for mama, he'll do it for me. If he did it for daddy, he'll do it for me. If he did it for 103 years, he'll do it for Pastor Hunt. It is my inspiration that the Lord will provide, but it is not my obligation. It's not your obligation to be like anybody but you. It is not your obligation to keep on doing things the same old way because that's how you made it over. Baby, it clearly is not working. And God is saying do a new thing. Be inspired by the past, but be obligated to the advancement of your future. He's saying if you can afford it, go on and change that couch. Go on and take that plastic off that couch. Now you got retirement money. Go on and buy something else. Stop get that big old TV that way too much. If it falls on you, it'll kill you. If you got the money, go to Walmart and buy a new TV. Go ahead. Your past should be a, what's your inspiration. My inspiration, if I bought that one, I'll buy another one, and it'll be better. It ain't personal. When you can do better, you do better. Few more years, when this suit starts wearing, I'm not gonna keep wearing and say, oh, that's the suit I used to wear when I came to Liberty Baptist Church three years ago, baby. I'm gonna go online to Brooks Brothers and I'm gonna buy me another one. It's my inspiration, but not my obligation. And what we allow our past to do is we allow our past to trap us. And it brings about insanity. I hit y'all with this a few minutes ago. Oh, the Lord's working with me on this text today. Uh, if you've been bumping your head for years and years and years, it feels like insanity, don't it? Mm -hmm. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. And that's what obligation makes you do. It worked this time, it's gonna work over and over and over <laughs> again. We keep blaming everybody else for where we at. It's everybody's fault. No, the past ought to let you know that he'll make a way. Anybody here know that? But our obligation says God's gonna do a new thing. God wants to do a new thing in our lives. 
The song even says, the old song says, please be patient with me. God is not through, me not through with me yet. Some of us live such obligated by the past lives. Mr. Leach might as well come on up and put us in the casket right now. Say it, say it. Because we don't feel that the Lord can do anything else. We've limited God to our past and our past with some great past. And I'm not talking about church only. I'm talking about our lives. Because watch this, though. When we come in here, we are the collective byproduct of all of us individually. Yeah. How we are collectively is oftentimes how we are individually. Do you know who you are? The Lord been calling you out to do some things, and you've been saying, oh, that just ain't me. I don't want all that new stuff. But the Lord is saying, did you ask me about it? <laughs> come on, preacher. You think I, you think, oh. Come on, come on, come on. God wants to do a new thing through your sickness. The doctor didn't come in and told you I got some new medication. Only thing you got to do is exercise. Come see me a few more times. And then somebody, I don't know who you are, said, well, my grandmama used to take cod liver oil. <laughs> and if that was good for her, that's good for me. I ain't thinking about all this new medicine. I don't want to do all this new thing. And the Lord is saying, do you think I'd have the doctor come in the room to deliver you after you prayed all that night? For an antidote, I have now placed a physician who knows the Lord in your presence, but you still saying you'd rather be sick because your grandmama had caught liver oil? It worked, though. <laughs> I want to make you well. I want to give you some assistance. But if your mind is in captivity, you can't get well. <laughs> your money is funny. I know I got about half y'all on that. Oh, yeah. Your money is funny all the time. God's saying, I need you to do a new thing. I need you to fast on all them clothes you buying you can't afford. I need you to watch out from buying a car that you can't afford to put gas in. I need you to save a little bit. I want to do a new thing. But you know what you're telling the Lord? I deserve this. <laughs> My parents didn't have, I didn't have, so I got to have this right now. And so your money will stay funny. God's saying, will you do a new thing? Will you trust me? Will you do a new thing? God wants to give you a new thing if you're broken hearted. Well, Some folk are evil because they're broken hearted. Well. And the Lord wants you to put you in a new state of mind. Um, the Lord wants you to let go of that person that hurt you. The Lord wants you to let go of that person that got on your last nerves. And God wants you to open up your heart so that somebody may be able to bless you and that you are not broken hearted. And some of us cannot embrace a new thing because we are in captivity by our brokenheartedness. I'm almost through. We, we said in, in Bible class, we talked about some stuff y'all wanted to talk about. And what came up was singles ministry. So I'm going to talk to the singles for a minute. All right. Your new thing could be your boo thing. But you missed it. Your new thing could be your boo thing, but you missed it. Uh, you might be single because your knight in shining armor right, walked right past you, but you rolled your eyes. Uh -uh. You might have had the woman of your dreams. You know that one that's going to pick you up? When you were torn down, but you too busy uh, 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 
checking off a checklist of how much money she got. She might not have much money, but she might be able to lift you up. And so your new thing or your boo thing might have been missed, not because the Lord ain't sent them, but because you missed it. You were too busy looking for Morris Chestnut. You were too busy looking for Halle Berry. You were too busy worrying about social sophistication. Uh, you were worrying about if they're going to be an alpha or AKA. You were worried about they going to an HBCU or Harvard. And you miss the garbage man who makes $100,000 a year who would love your dirty draws and you miss. You missed your new thing that was your boo thing. Brothers, I ain't through. I'm, I'm looking for y'all. Uh, um, some brothers, you want somebody that makes as much as you or more than you because you ain't trying to pay all the bills. You ain't trying to do that. She walked past you. She might have had a job at McDonald's, but she might have been in school while she was working at McDonald's, and you walked past her because you were too spiritually sedity to understand that while she's on fries, she has the ability to lift you up. You missed your new thing and your boo thing, not because of you, not because of the Lord, but you missed it. Don't miss your boo. Woo! You was looking. I tell Drew this. I hope Drew's watching from Hampton. I told Drew this. Drew likes tall guys. How <laughs> every guy come in the house, I'm like, I gotta shoot him. <laughs> he on the basketball or football team. Can't he can't get in the door. And I'm sitting there looking like, ooh. <laughs> so when I saw my baby, like most teenagers, getting a little bit shallow, I said, go to Hampton, and you're entitled to look at what you, what you like. But that little accountant that's about my size, that little accountant that's down there working hard, he might take care of you like your daddy did, so don't miss out. Say it, say it. Don't miss out on your new thing or your boo thing, baby. <laughs> that little short guy can't be on nobody's team. Might take care of you like your daddy did. I know I'm right about it. You're right. You're right. Some of us are lonely because we miss our new thing. But God is getting ready to bring that thing back around. Come on. So you'll be able to recognize it when you see it. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> when we deal with this issue of the past, the first thing we have to understand in our now circumstances are different now than they were then. That's right. And that's really the problem. You can't put processes of old on a modern time. Nope. I'm sorry that we can't do it, but it's impossible. Right. So that's why the past can only be your inspiration, because you understand and not your obligation. I, that's because you learn from the past that no matter what the process is, God is relevant for whatever time you are in. Say it. Preach. Circumstances, bad circumstances can lock you up. We've talked about the bad stuff. But can I let you know the good stuff that can lock you up? Say it. Tell us. I don't do this, but my family sees this out of me all the time. I won't let my past stop my blessing. Because it can stop my good times. You know, when I go to the grocery store, I like the Starbucks cream. And it's $7. And? And the regular one is $3. And Drew be with me like, Daddy, why are you buying the Starbucks creamer? Because the Lord blessed me to buy it. And I'm not going to let the fact I used to couldn't buy it stop me from buying it right now. I'm not going to sit on my money because I'm scared of going back to what things used to be. I'm going to revel in the glory of God right now. What I can reasonably buy, I'm going to buy. What I can reasonably do, I'm going to do. I'm not going to be afraid. I 
I ain't going to be no fool, but I ain't going to be afraid. If I want steak, I'm going to get steak. That's right. I want some shoes, I'm going to buy some shoes. That's right. And I'm not going to let the fact that I used to go into the store looking for the cheap creamer to stop me in the blessings of God for the good creamer. <laughs> Many of us live our lives sitting on fear. That's right. We're afraid because the past has, remember when you didn't have it? You might lose it. But what, is, what does the Lord say? What does the Lord say? He says, I will provide in the wilderness. <laughs> See, the real thing is when we reach a certain plateau, when we feel that we have arrived, we're, we're scared to jump out on chain because we don't want to go back to the wilderness. We don't want to buy that coffee. We don't want to buy that suit because we're scared to go back to when we didn't have none. But what the Lord tells us is when he does a, does a new thing, you might go through the wilderness, but he's going to make a way. <laughs> See, many of us don't step out on the new thing because we are afraid. And the Chaldeans in, ba in Babylon, in our minds, they keep us afraid. They tell you what we're going to do if you don't do this. They ain't got you worried about if the child is going to walk out on you in your life. Step out on that new thing and understand the Lord will provide. If he takes some friends away, he'll give you some new ones. If he takes some money away, you'll be like Job. You'll have more than you had when you started. If you trust him and never doubt, he'll surely bring you out. God has a divine reason, watch this, for delivering us with a new thing. It's a reason why God selects to do a new thing. Humankind deifies process. That's what we like to do. We like to talk, Pastor Hardy, about what we did. How we did it, how we raised money, how we went to school. And because God knows that humankind will deify process, and over time the process becomes more reflective of our own abilities and not God's omnipotence. Uh, uh, see, do y'all know that's really why we have a church history? Why we have a church anniversary? Yes, we talk about the Jackson legacy. Yes, we talk about 104 years ago, but we talk, yes, we talk about the choir, but we talk about it from the preview of what God did and not what we did. Because God took some nobodies and made them somebody because of somebody who loves everybody. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know some of y'all rolling your eyes. We don't celebrate the pastor's anniversary because of what I did. We celebrate it because God brought me here and God did it. For all that I've been through, God has blessed me to stand here. MDF didn't do it. Morehouse didn't do it. Charlotte and Andrew didn't do it. But if it had not been for the Lord on my side, take my name off my anniversary program and put God did it. I figured y'all shout now, it's about me. God did it. In verse 21, God reminds us why he does a new thing. He says, because we are his. Because he formed us. He made us. He took you through what he took you through. He strengthened you. He gave you the knowledge and the fortitude to press on. And so God reminds us that he does a new thing because we are his. He also reminds us that we do a new thing so that we might declare his praise. We do a new thing so when he brings you across, you'll say there's no way I could have made it had it not been the Lord. He brings you through to do a different thing so you can say he blesses me whether I do it in an old way and he blessed me when I did it a new way. He brings you through so that you might shout glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. He brings you through so you can have a shout 
and a dance and give him all the glory, the honor, and the praise. Is there anybody here this morning that wants to give him the glory, the honor, and the praise? What? He brought you out so you can remember that when you came out, it wasn't because you sang so good. When you came out, wasn't hunt because you preached so good. When you came out, wasn't China because you so fine. When you came out, wasn't Pastor Hardy because you so eloquent. When you came out, because it wasn't because you so faithful. You came out because he did it. He did it. He wants you to do a new thing so you don't try to get the glory. He doesn't tell them. He doesn't tell them. And Isaiah doesn't tell them, oh, I'm going to bring ten plagues to Babylon. He's going to do a new thing. He didn't say, y'all going to be crossing them. I'm going to part a Red Sea, and I'm going to give you, Isaiah, a rod. He said, put that rod down, because I'm going to do a new thing. Uh, he, he doesn't tell them exactly how he's going to do it. He doesn't give them instructions like he did in the past, but he puts in their spirit that he's going to do a new thing. Can I stand up here on the Mount Sinai? Can I stand down here on the Jordan River? Can I stand now on King Drive and say, Liberty, God's going to do a new thing. I don't know what it's going to sound like, but it's going to be a new thing. I don't know what it's going to walk like, but it's going to be a new thing. I believe it because the, the past inspires me that if God did it for them, he'll do it for us. God will always do a new thing to deliver us. Our own intuition, not even our own faithfulness, could have brought us over. You couldn't pray enough to be brought over. You couldn't come to enough prayer meetings to be brought over. You couldn't came to church enough to be brought over. But the Lord brought us over. God chooses a new thing that he might get the glory all by himself so that we might praise him for doing the unexpected. Did you wake up this morning waiting for God to do the unexpected, the unimaginable, to bring you out? Did you wake up this morning looking for God to do something better than you thought he would do? God wants to use the last person that you think could bless you to be your blessing. God wants to deliver you from your sickness. God wants to bring you out, having us step on uncertain charter waters of faithfulness. God wants to do a new thing. God wants to do a new thing by having us sacrifice our comfort zones for God's presence. Liberty, we stand and inspired by the past, but we're obligated to our future. Forget the church today. Stop being comfortable being sick. God wants to do a new thing. Stop being comfortable being broke. God wants to do a new thing. Stop being sad about being all by yourself. You can't find no man. You can't find no woman. Just be still. God getting ready to do a new thing. He just perfecting you so what's for you will come and be a blessing to you. Stop being brokenhearted and mean because of what somebody did in the church 25 years ago. They dead and rotten in Burr Oak, Lincoln, and Restvale. And you still talking about what they did? God wants to do a new thing. He wants to do a new thing. But as I'm inspired by the past, I'm reminded of the words of the songwriter. Every day with Jesus. Every day with Jesus. When he gets ready to do a new thing, it's sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. That's a new thing. Jesus saves and keeps me. He's the one that I adore. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Yesterday was all right, but today is sweeter than the day before. And I'm getting ready today to make sure tomorrow is sweeter than the day before. Well, there was another songwriter that said, great is that faithfulness. Great is that faithfulness. Not yesterday by yesterday, but morning by morning. 
new mercies I see. All I have needed, thou hast provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Is there anybody here ready to step out in the morning? Is there anybody here waiting for the new day? Is there anybody here that feels better, so much better, since they laid their burdens down? That's just you getting ready for a new thing. Somebody shout new thing, blessed thing, powerful thing, delivering thing, healing thing, walking thing, talking thing, blessing thing, new thing. Somebody say, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Don't miss. Don't miss. Don't miss your new thing. I'll leave you with this so you don't miss it. The new thing going to happen anyway. Either for you or somebody else. So you might as well get the new thing. Don't miss it. We pray you enjoy this evening's Friday night word. I know that you have been blessed and I know that you are stronger now than what you were before you tuned in. We thank you for being a part of this ministry. And if you want to give to this ministry and support to this ministry, we invite you to give through Givelify, PayPal, or Cash App. And you can also give if you do not have the monetary means. You can give to this ministry by sharing the good news and sharing this message with your family and friends and telling everyone about Friday Night Word and about Liberty Baptist Church of Chicago. We pray that God's peace will be with you until we meet again.